Uh, we had a very exciting first day yesterday at the Getty, and I'm delighted that so many of you found it worth your while to um, see what is coming next. And I think I can promise you um, that it will not be a letdown. My original um, uh, welcoming remarks have already been printed in the conference program, unbeknownst to me, so I'm not going to read them. Uh, please consider yourselves uh, welcome. And. Um, uh, more than welcome, and we are, in, uh, we are really delighted to be able to um, uh, collaborate with the Getty Research Institute and the Getty uh, Conservation Institute on this uh, tremendously worthwhile event. Um, it is a pleasant duty to acknowledge um, the uh, financial support of all the sponsoring um, institutions um, mentioned in your program, which I'm not, again, uh, going to enumerate one by one. Uh, they are already uh, documented. But within UCLA, I would like to um, gratefully acknowledge um, substantial support received in both funds and um, um, human labor by the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, uh, the Department of Art History, the Department of Asian Languages, the um, Asia Institute and its program for Central Asia, the uh, Center for Chinese Studies, and last but by no means least, the Center for Buddhist Studies. And uh, I would also very much um, like to single out uh, Jennifer um, uh, Jung Kim, who has been a true bodhisattva in shouldering most of the, um, the uh, uh, administrative and organizational burden in making this event a reality while I have been in, on sabbatical. So please uh, join me in uh, giving her a big round of applause. We are also very grateful to Elizabeth Lester at the Asia Institute um, for um, coordinating uh, matters uh, from her end. I, don't have, I haven't seen her yet. Is she here? Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and also to uh, the graduate student volunteers who have been manning the des uh, desk outside. Uh, without the, uh, a great deal of uh, voluntary and enthusiastic support of this nature, we could not have uh, our, section, uh, our session today. Um, the, um, the manner of proceeding is basically the same as uh, yesterday. So uh, rather than uh, saying anything more, I think I will yield the rest of um, my allotted time this morning to um, uh, Professor William Bodyford, um, who is the, um, uh, the moderator um, for session four, the cosmology of the caves. And um, he will introduce the speakers. And you'll hear more, hear more from me uh, in the afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Welcome and good luck. Good morning. Uh, I'm William Bodiford. I teach Buddhist studies here at UCLA. And uh, it's my uh, great pleasure today to be the moderator, uh, which means I get to enjoy the conference, but I don't really have to do anything. Um, I do uh, also want to uh, thank everyone who has supported this event. It's just fantastic. Uh, when I began my study of Buddhism, uh, Dunhuang uh, loomed very large uh, from the beginning right on uh, through. And uh, so many uh, treasures are here in Los Angeles that we've all read about, we've studied in photographs, and never imagined uh, that they would be so uh, accessible and uh, so prominent prominent in the public imagination. Uh, with no further ado, let me uh, introduce our first uh, presenter, uh, Sonia Lee. Uh, uh, Sonia is a professor of Chinese art and visual culture at the University of Southern California uh, on the other side of town. And uh, she will be uh, speaking about mountains and forests and Buddhist asceticism as the locality of enlightenment.
Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank uh, Neville, uh, Masha, and Lothar for inviting me uh, to speak at this symposium. And I also would like to also thank my colleagues at UCLA for welcoming uh, me from the other side of town. Uh, <laughs> Like many at this event, uh, I would like to express my uh, appreciation of uh, Director Funding Shi. Uh, besides her work on management and conservation of the caves at Dunhuang, uh, she's actually a uh, well-published scholar of Dunhuang art and archaeology. In fact, for uh, my paper today, I have relied on her pioneering work uh, that she has published on the Buddhist life story uh, in Dunhuang wall painting. So thank you. So I would like to begin with a few images from Cave 285, which by now uh, I hope it's uh, quite familiar to many of you. Uh, it is rep represented by one of the replica caves at the Getty uh, Donghuang's uh, exhibition. For those of you who have visited the replica cave or the actual one in Donghuang, you may remember seeing uh, rows of images depicting monks seated in meditation along the lower parts of the ceiling, as indicated by uh, the, the blue arrow. There are also uh, stucco st uh, statues in the niches of the west wall where uh, you find uh, the main figure uh, shown in meditative pose. These images have lately been the subject of a heated debate about the function of cave temples along the ancient Silk Road. One of the key questions being raised is whether or not Buddhist monks actually use these structures to meditate or to carry out other monastic practices inside. Uh, for those of you who were at the Getty yesterday, uh, Professor Eugene Wong uh, brought up this issue already. So for me, uh, what is at stake in this simply, uh, rather seemingly simple question uh, is the way we interpret pictorial images inside cave temples in order to understand the use and value of these structures. In modern scholarship on Buddhist art and archaeology, and also architecture, most researchers recognize that the pictorial images inside a cave temple have something to tell us about its religious function. For images of the meditating monk, some have assumed that the space in which such images were found uh, was likely built for meditation, or having incorporated that function as one of uh, its many meanings. Bob Schaff, uh, my esteemed colleague in Chinese Buddhism, uh, who will speak uh, right after this, uh, goes further by disputing the link between pictorial images and religious function of cave temples altogether. In a uh, 2013 article titled Art in the Dark, he argues that cave temples in Western China ought to be understood as a devotional ground for the laity rather than as a place of practices for the monastics. To stress the critical role played by the lay patrons in shaping the structure's meaning, uh, Bob uh, proposes a reading of cave temples as a uh, mortuary shrine in which lay patrons would entrust the deceased relatives to the care of Buddhist deities being honored in the caves. As such, the images were difficult, if not impossible, to see inside, and hence, in his words, quote, inconsequential to the structure's function, end quote. I think Bob is right about uh, many cave temples in Donghuang, where the construction was motivated by the needs and agendas of prominent local clans. At the same time, however, I hesitate to dismiss so readily the viability of pictorial images in helping us understand the meaning of cave temples. Even though the subject matter does not seem to correspond with the lay orientation of the structure's overall usage, I think it's still critical to reckon with the fact that images therein can be interpreted on multiple levels, just as the cave temples have held multiple functions and values for different groups of stakeholders throughout its history. Moreover, I believe that images at cave temples are meant to be seen, and that uh, meanings, meanings embedded in the selection and style representation would be activated through their creation and viewing. So I say this sort of out of my uh, reason that uh, for our historians, we have to emphasize that images have to be seen. Otherwise, I'd be out of work. <laughs> uh, in this talk, therefore, I intend to explore further the multivalence and visuality in the depiction of monastic practitioners engaged in meditation uh, with several examples from Donghuang's uh, later history, namely from the 10th to the 12th centuries, or 13th century. So these are the two examples I would like to focus on. Uh, because there's a large number of visual examples related to the theme of meditation in cave temples, 
I have chosen to concentrate on a particular kind, namely those from the pictorial narrative on the life of the Buddha. These images pertain to the six year period during which Siddhartha was in search of the path to enlightenment. The reason behind choosing this particular part of the life story lies in my interest in examining the ecological dimension of Buddhist monastic practices, a topic which has remained rather under study. What I mean by this is that uh, the setting for meditation as depicted in wall paintings have much to say about what seeing a Buddhist practitioner in action meant to the period uh, viewer. So um, the setting means both within the pictorial frame and what's outside. So it's this interaction, constant interplay between the inside and outside that I'm very interested in. And I call this uh, ecological dimension. And I would demonstrate these pictorial images, far from being visual aids for the adapts, were meant to present to the laity the monastic ideal, as well as explain the source of divinity behind certain Buddhist deities who have who have come to possess great power upon realizing this ideal. In Dunhuang, the life story of the Buddha offers a particularly productive local context for an inquiry of this kind. Because the motif, uh, the motif had long served as a thematic framework within which the Buddha's uh, choice of meditation as the preferred method for enlightenment was articulated through a purposeful contrast with non-Buddhist asceticism of which the Buddha was also a practitioner at the beginning of his spiritual quest. As it turned out, the biographical format was popular to articulate the benefits of meditational practices at cave temples. Besides the historical Buddha, the format was adapted to present other Buddhist deities as well. So at the, uh, toward the end of my talk, I will introduce one such example from Southwest China, where the 10 austerities of Liu Wenjun uh, was popular at cave temples in Dazhu. So let me now introduce you to the two key examples from uh, Mogao Caves. So the first one uh, on your right is from Cave 61, which was built in the middle of the 10th century. And the second one on your, your left uh, is from Cave 76. Uh, it was repainted in the 11th to the 12th century, uh, uh, as you see on, on the screen. So, um, and the, uh, the two uh, episodes that uh, I will focus on pertains to the part of Buddhist life where Siddhartha, having decided to leave his princely life all behind, uh, was in the middle of his search for the path of enlightenment. So in uh, Cave 61, uh, he's shown in multiple scenes in which he wanders around the woods outside uh, the city Raja Gaha. Okay, here, here. And you can see that uh, he falls down from exhaustion uh, here and then uh, in this area, you see the really critical uh, moment when he accepts the, uh, the, uh, the milk rice from a local woman. Uh, so he, this is a moment marking the realization that uh, uh, it's important to pursue a more moderate course of practice rather than going to the extreme. And so he eats, uh, regains uh, his former uh, golden hume and other 32 uh, marks of divinity, and then so he, uh, try to get the pointer out, uh, so he washes the, uh, the bowl in the river, and also, uh, and there uh, is Indra, the god, who dis disguises as uh, a bird, and he takes the bowl away as a, uh, as a relic, and then also uh, Siddhartha uh, Bay uh, takes a bath inside a river here. Now, uh, on your uh, left, uh, the the, the same uh, storyline is presented in three episodes. So at the bottom, you see that the prince is cutting his hair, actually get cut off, but uh, he's giving the hair to his attendant who's taking the horse and the hair back uh, to uh, where he, 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 he left behind. And then in the middle, uh, you see that he's seated inside a mountain cave. Uh, that's actually his uh, attendant here. And uh, he is, uh, as the Katur says, he's practicing very difficult uh, um, uh, asceticism or uh, difficult practices uh, uh, for six years. And then here, uh, this is the moment when he uh, takes a bath in uh, the river uh, Laranjana. And interestingly, uh, uh, rather than showing the actual river, he uh, you just see some blue to indicate that he's actually in water, not just sitting in a mountain cave. <coughs> So um, here uh, on the screen, I lay out the, the different uh, layers of setting that I would like to focus on. So far, I have talked about 
Uh, I'll try to get the for now. So uh, I just uh, have related to you what's inside the scene now. I will talk a bit more about uh, the scene within the larger composition and then the, how the motif fits within the cave overall program. So let me start with uh, cave 61. Uh, so the detail you've been showing comes from this particular panel, specifically panel 28. Uh, it, it shows you uh, from top to bottom. So this is the part with uh, the bird taking uh, the, uh, the, the bowl uh, away as relic. And this panel fits in uh, um, a larger narrative about the Buddhist life story where uh, it goes from 28 to 29 and immediately following this uh, whole episode about his uh, ascetic uh, practices, you have the moment of uh, uh, subjugating Mara and of course the uh, moment of enlightenment. So it's a very purposeful contrast with uh, the, the kind of activities you see here and then going to this. And then within the larger context, so this is an overview of the cave. And as you can see, uh, the life of the Buddha actually runs really uh, long, basically along the north, uh, the south, west, and north wall. So it has uh, about 33 panels. So what I've been showing you uh, comes from this area. And one point that I would like to make is that uh, it's the motif is located along the so-called circumambulate path. So that means that when people visit the cave, uh, uh, they will walk along, and since it's quite close to the eye level, so these details uh, can be seen. Uh, and this is a very large cave, and so uh, at certain time of the day, uh, it's actually quite bright inside. So let me now turn to uh, Cave 76. Uh, this is the bigger composition from which this uh, uh, part of the story uh, comes. So, uh, so far I've been showing you this three. And it's turned out there's a, uh, a circular movement sort of denoting uh, the progression of the narrative. So it starts with uh, the birth of Siddhartha in the middle, and then it goes very quickly to uh, the uh, very fateful meeting between the king and his astrologer, where uh, the king uh, inquires about uh, the future of the, uh, the prince, and then uh, it skips forward in time to uh, the moment of great departure where the, uh, the prince, uh, Siddhartha, leaves the palace or his princely existence behind. And then here, this is where uh, he cuts off his hair and then handing that over to his uh, tenant. So it forms a circular movement around it. And now this particular uh, composition comes from a larger motif consisting of eight uh, uh, pagodas. Uh, so hence the term, uh, the, the name, uh, the eight luminous pagodas that occupies the entire east wall of uh, Cave 76. As I mentioned earlier, this cave was first built in the Tang period, uh, 7th, 8th century, but then it was repainted uh, later in the 11th, 12th century. And unfortunately, the lower part of the entire cave uh, uh, was damaged. So we only get the top four. And so this is the first of the eight pagodas, so, and it goes one, three, five, seven. And, uh, just based on speculation and other comparable examples, we know that this is probably where the moment of uh, subjugating Mara or an enlightenment will be depicted here. Uh, give you a sense of the bigger uh, pictorial program. Uh, let me go to this, not the most perfect diagram, but I guess you get a sense. So this is the east wall, and I'm showing you just two images to uh, indicate uh, the location, and then this is the west wall where you have a, a newest looking uh, sculpture uh, occupying the, the east wall, and as you can see, the, the, the damages to the lower part of the, uh, of the wall. And then so you can see the damages. Uh, so this is a little bit of the, uh, the north wall, uh, showing you other uh, uh, motifs depicted inside <coughs> uh, the cave. So based on this comparison of the different layers of setting in our two examples, I would like to make three observations. First, the Buddhist path to enlightenment was articulated differently through pictorial representation in cave temples of Nunghuang. In Cave 61, the first example, Siddhartha is shown wandering uh, around the woods, mostly by himself and occasionally interacting with few others. <clears throat> While the mode of representing the setting is close to the storyline, uh, the contrast between a wandering ascetic and a confident practitioner in meditation is unmistakable. Like an ascetic, a Buddhist also practices by himself, 
But instead of testing the limits of his body, the focus is now on mental concentration, which is represented by a seated body in a, <clears throat> in a uh, isolated place, like a mountain uh, cave. It is interesting to note that this contrast has a long history uh, in, er in, the, in early Buddhist art of Gandhara. Uh, let me go forward to this. Um, <clears throat> you see Siddhartha in search of the path to enlightenment is part of the larger uh, um, narrative cycle on his life story. So uh, what you're looking at uh, are some fragments uh, in the Asian Museum of Berlin where you see uh, the uh, particular episode being represented with this emaciated figure. Uh, it also recalls a very famous line in, uh, in one of these early scriptures where it says the Buddha touches the skin of his belly, but in fact he's touching his backbone because he has nothing left in his uh, stomach. And then all of a sudden going from this to the moment of uh, defeating Mara and enlightenment. And then here again, uh, another very famous example showing you the emaciated Buddha. <clears throat> so my point is that it's uh, part of this life cycle and this just uh, position is unmistakable going from this to this. And in Donghuang, uh, some of the earliest uh, examples of uh, the Buddhist life story uh, seen in cave uh, 290, which dates from the sixth century, the two scenes are just both side by side. So I am showing you, uh, this is a very large cycle, which Director Frank has written there extensively on with uh, the late Master Chang. And this is this episode uh, here, the end, where he's practicing asceticism, and then here's the moment in like month. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> Uh, so uh, one thing that I want to point out is that the, the, the two episodes that you see here takes place in an open landscape. And uh, in Cave 61, uh, you see that uh, this composition uh, more or less continues uh, uh, this tradition, but what uh, would change uh, in the next century or so uh, can be seen in Cave 76, uh, where you see that uh, this interest in de uh, depicting uh, the two episodes in the open landscape goes to this. <clears throat> so the contrast uh, between the two modes of practice have become less apparent in the setting as the episode of Siddhartha's aestheticism is now collapsed uh, with uh, his uh, subsequent preference of meditation. So here, you're not seeing him wandering around at all, and there's actually no reference to his aestheticism. Instead, he's being, uh, um, given the seated form, which is a indicator of, uh, of uh, the Buddha's choice of uh, meditation. So um, the painting shows him already in this uh, pose of meditation, and I think it also underscores the fact that uh, there's a, a sense of superiority uh, in uh, promoting the Buddhist way rather than the non-Buddhist way of asceticism. And I will come back to this point uh, later. The second observation I would like to make concerns the spatial context of these two compositions. The scene of Siddhartha in search of enlightenment uh, is visual to anyone who visits the cave, as I noted earlier. In Cave 61, it is located along the circumambulatory path along the central altar. I have argued elsewhere that this cave, uh, from its location to architectural layout, design of pictorial program, and uh, compositional design ex exhibited a remarkable degree of familiarity with caves built by the predecessors of the main patron, Chao Yun-jong. This familiarity in turn confirms what text re textual records tell us all along, namely that Cave 61 was visited by the patrons, his family members, and associates on important occasions throughout uh, the year. For uh, Cave 76, although we don't have much information about the patrons who sponsored the repainting, uh, during the Tangut uh, period, the mural's location on the east entrance wall indicates that uh, whoever visits the cave would see the mural upon exiting the structure. Moreover, uh, the very act of repainting the cave interior suggests that the new patrons were keen on remaking the interior to satisfy their own needs. We can glimpse into what these needs were through the notable changes in the representation of Siddhartha's quest, as well as the thematic context to which it now belongs. I would argue that with the new setting also came a certain degree of anxiety about the legitimacy, uh, its, its legitimacy as part of the broader Buddhist tradition. By incorporating Siddhartha's 
quest into the, into, uh, the new way of practicing Buddhism under the Tangut, the patrons were likely interested in validating it in the eyes of the devotees. It is uh, beyond the scope of this paper to delve into the introduction of Tangut Buddhism in Donghuang, but I would like to point out, uh, so the third and uh, last observation, that uh, the framing of Siddhartha's asceticism in the visual language of Buddhist meditation indicates an interest in minimizing all references to non-Buddhist practices in presenting the Buddhist life story. One may read these as a sign of orthodoxy, but in the history of Mongol caves, there had always been a tradition of avoiding the depiction of the Buddha being engaged in the more extreme forms of asceticism that was regarded as non-Buddhist or even heretical. The only context in which uh, extreme practices such as self-mutilation or self-mortification associated with the figure of the Buddha, or the historical Buddha, uh, is in the Jatakas or stories about the previous lives of the Buddha. So they, uh, these uh, aesthetic practices show up in his previous life, but not the final incarnation. That's my point. Um, so in the example of uh, Cave uh, 254, which we saw yesterday several times, uh, which dates from the late 5th century, uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, the famous uh, Jataka about the hungry tigress, or the Mahasava Jataka, uh, placed side by side with the uh, the subjugation of the Mara uh, here. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> in the later centuries, uh, there was a revival uh, of, the, uh, of interest in the Buddhist life story, where Jatakas emphasizing bodily sacrifice were incorporated into other motifs, such as the Sutra of Weeping Kindness. So if we zoom forward in time and go to the 10th century, this is just a detail. Uh, you see that Jataka uh, uh, are incorporated not so much as uh, part of the Buddha's uh, life story, but in fact into other sutra paintings, such as uh, this one, the Sutra on Repaying Kindness. So this is the Sujati Jataka, uh, famous one, uh, in which uh, uh, Sujati uh, um, tries to practice filial piety uh, to feed uh, parents by, with his own flesh. So uh, the episode I'm showing you here comes from the lower part of this larger, very large composition. And here you can see that he is cutting uh, the flash from his uh, thigh. And it's also articulated in the cartouche, so the parents are receiving the food from his uh, own son. So to uh, conclude my discussion of the two examples from Mogao Caves, I would like to introduce the motifs of 10 austerities of Liu Benjun uh, from Southwest China to switch gear. The example I'm showing you here on the screen is from Baolingshan in Daju, now a district in western Chongqing. The motif uh, forms a fitting contrast with our examples from Donghuang, uh, as they were made roughly in the same time period as the one from uh, Mogao Cave 76, the coexistence of two different ways of using the biographical format to articulate the pros and cons of asceticism underscores a considerable degree of diversity in thinking about the Buddhist way of achieving spiritual enlightenment uh, at the time. Liu Benjun, uh, some of you might know, uh, was a Buddhist master who was active in Chengdu and the nearby region in the late 9th and early 10th century. He's primarily known for the 10 austerities that he practiced throughout his career. So uh, the composition uh, occupies the upper part of the, uh, the cliff service. And so here are some details. So showing you the 10 austerity from one to 10. <clears throat> so um, through the sacrifice of different parts of the, his body, starting with burning his finger uh, and also burning his kneecap, cut off his arm, gouging out his eye, burning the top of his head and even cutting off, or burning his genitals. So uh, the whole body is quite badly damaged. Uh, he managed to gain great uh, magical power, which was then utilized to cure the sick uh, warn off evil spirits, and even rescue the dead from the underworld. And Baoling Shan, rather than showing you the benefits of the results of these uh, miraculous power, i.e. showing how great he, uh, he is in, uh, in his compassion for others, uh, his gruesome sacrifices uh, were on, on full display. So in each scene, you can see that he's in the very act of cutting off or doing that self-sacrifice, a particular self-sacrifice. And here is a uh, more uh, sort of iconic figure showing you the result uh, of all the sacrifices. 
So I think the choice was quite purposely made not to encourage the viewer to follow Liu Wenjun's action, that you don't cut yourself in front uh, in, at the caves, but rather to explain the divinity of this cult figure to his late uh, followers. The function reminds us a bit of uh, what we find in Cave uh, 76 at Mogao, where the eight key moments in Sakamuni Buddha's final incarnation were celebrated as a series of painted icons. But far from being an art in the dark, uh, the images at Baoding Shan were meant to be seen, because as you can see, there's really no structure built inside, and it's quite exposed uh, quite openly. And from various sources, we know that uh, it's often been conceived or called a, uh, I don't know what happened to my computer, uh, that it's a practicing ground or a teaching uh, ground uh, for lay followers. So I would end here. Thank you. Should be the next slide. Yeah, you ready to go? Yes. And can we dim the lights even more? It should, it should in, the, in the yeah, we yeah. can dim them. Yeah, not sure. completely, but should, it should sure, be right a here. little bit lower. Yeah. Well, you have to do it. Right? I'm not going to touch. Yeah, that's better. That good? Yeah, that's better. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. I think I think put the cameras. Can we have it even darker than that? Okay, um, without uh, further delay, uh, we'll proceed to the next uh, speaker, uh, Bob Scharf, uh, Distinguished Professor of Buddhist Studies from the uh, University of California at Berkeley. And uh, as you just heard, uh, he will uh, talk about the uh, re religious uh, function of the uh, caves in terms of Buddhist ritual. Let's see if I, I feel like an organist here with two. Okay, there we go. Maybe this will work. Maybe this will work. Um, okay, so uh, th uh, thanks to the organizers uh, of the symposium for their invitation to participate in this uh, very impressive gathering. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting material that I worked on some time ago. And that is already familiar to some of the specialists in the room, for which I apologize, but I thought it would still be useful today particularly for the non-specialists, as a way to frame the exhibition as my talk deals with broader issues um, in terms of the question of the purpose and function of the grottos at Dunhuang. And I, I should also say that it, even for the specialists, I would like to reiterate what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. Uh, so for example, I do not say that the images have nothing to do with the ritual function of the cave. What I'm saying is that the ritual function of the cave is not what we think it is. It's not about monastic meditation. Uh, but the, the images are absolutely central to understanding what the caves are about. So um, scholars, including art historians, archaeologists, and specialists in religion, tend to approach the Magal complex as if it were a monastic site, and the caves themselves as if they were intended, at least in part, for monastic practice. They then assume that the function of the cave, the specific practices that went on therein, can be determined on the basis of the architectural design and iconographic program. So that caves with small cubicles off the main hall, such as you see here, uh, sometimes they're even called Vihara caves, this is 268, 285, and 487 at Mogao, were intended for meditation, or dhyana, or chan, uh, while caves with um, elaborate Altars or sutra trablo on the walls were intended for visualization practices. And Chinese scholars sometimes talk accordingly of meditation caves or chanku versus visualization caves, guangku. Now, they have in mind a distinction 
uh, made by specialists in Indian Buddhist sites between Vihara caves and what are sometimes called Chaitya caves, found at monuments such, such as Ajanta. And I don't have time today to go into the function of the South Asian caves, but I will note very briefly several problems with this analogy. Uh, for one thing, the typical monastic cells found in Indian sites are large enough to be used as personal residences, whereas the cells found at Magal are tokens, particularly in 285 that everybody talks about. They're, they're barely, they're, they're large enough to kind of get into. You certainly couldn't dwell in them, and I don't even think you could meditate in them. Now, um, besides, it's difficult to use Ajanta in particular as an exemplar as we don't have a good read on it either. For example, if Ajanta were intended entirely as a monastic site, why the elaborate sensual imagery, imagery pulled from heavenly domains? The imagery seems more appropriate for temples intended to attract lay pilgrims and tourists rather than for secluded monastic retreat. If Ajanta was anything, it was a monument to the aspirations of some extraordinarily well-heeled royal donors. But then construction at Ajanta was never finished, was never completed. The site was never turned on, as it were. And so speculation as to its actual use remains somewhat moot. Now jumping very quickly, let's turn to Gazil, a major Central Asian site near the oasis town of Kucha, which is similarly approached by scholars as if it were a monastic site intended for or expressive of meditation practices. Now, Kazil reveals some of the problems with the Vihara cave, Chaitya cave dichotomy. Kazil does provide clear evidence of residential caves. They are, with one telling exception, unpainted. I should say, this is the exception. It was the, the picture I could find very quickly of a residential cave. This is one that was later converted to a shrine cave, but you have to imagine it without the painting inside. Um, now, they have windows and beds and stoves and nooks for storing things and the like, and no one would mistake them for meditation cells narrowly con conceived, much less for shrines. Now, these residential caves are typically a, a place adjacent, adjacent to shrine caves, either uh, shrine caves of the barrel vaulted type we're going to talk about or often square uh, unpainted caves that seem to have... Uh, been for some kind of services. So the archaeological suggest, evidence suggests that there was one residence cave intended to serve multiple shrine caves, which suggests that monks were distributed around the site so as to ritually service the adjacent shrines. Now the majority of what I'm calling shrine caves at Kizil, the caves that are adorned with Buddhist paintings and sculpted images, are almost invariably described in the literature as central pillar caves, hearkening back to the India Chaitya caves as a model. And these central pillar caves are intended, we are told, to facilitate circumambulation. Now for the purposes of my presentation today, I would briefly note two things. First, they are not by any stretch central pillars. They are barrel vaulted shrines that have low back chambers connected by two tunnels in which one finds a painted or sculpted Parinirvana Buddha at the back. Now, in short, if we don't inappropriately, th this is hard to see, but that's the remains of a Parinirvana uh, reclining Buddha at the back of, um, uh, of a Kizil cave. So if we don't inappropriately impose Indian or later Chinese models, the standard Kizil painted cave looks an awful lot like a shrine with a tomb at the back. And the tomb imagery will be a recurring uh, theme below. This is, a, this is a similar one, except instead of a, a sculpted Parinirvana, you have a painted Parinirvana. Now, the problem with sites like Kazil, and I have to forgo a discussion of a host of other strites, uh, sites stretching from Bamiyan to the Turfan region, is that there is simply too little known about the circumstances of their construction and the thought behind their iconographic programs. But this is not the case for major sites in central China, such as Yungang and Lungmen, for which we have a robust archive of epigraphic and literary sources. We know that Yungang and Lungmen caves were typically donated by pious emperors or members of the imperial family or eunuchs or other members of powerful local clans, also by monks and nuns, and almost always in the memory of deceased parents. Indeed, the caves are often in pairs, corresponding in a way to the pairs of donor images found at Dunhuang, with women on one side, men on the other. 
there is little question about the function of the Lungmen and Yungan caves. Scholars don't engage in idle speculation about whether these monuments were made for dhyana or visualization or, for that matter, narrative performance because such speculation is unnecessary and unwarranted. They were conspicuous displays of filial and religious piety, places where merit could be generated for family or clan in both the worldly and unworldly senses of the term through the construction, dedication, and worship of images. Now, while Yungong and Lungmen are different in time, place, and scope from Kizil, we do find a common theme emerging, and that is the theme of death, memorial ritual, and public displays of devotion. The analogies between shrine, cave, and tomb have been noted for many years by art historians and archaeologists both in China and the West. Uh, here is the famous example of Dunhuang Cave 85, again with its celestial imagery on the ceiling. Uh, this is Cave 249 with similar themes on the truncated pyramid ceiling. And compare those two to Tomb 5 at Ding Jia Chai in the town of Jiuquan, dated to the Northern Liang, right? That's, uh, the first half of the fifth century. And this was an important military town, by the way, in the Han through the Northern dynasties, much as was Dunhuang. Now, Tomb 5 is a double chamber and is a double chamber tomb, and the interior walls are plastered and painted precisely as are found at Dunhuang. This, uh, the ceiling contains images of Shi Wang Mu, Fu Shi, Nuwa, and the Lord of the East, a pictorial program understood rather roughly as an attempt to create a realm, a celestial realm, if one were, a heavenly realm or an, the, the other realm, and to depict the ascension of the, of the deceased. A number of Chinese and Western scholars have noted the iconographic similarities between such local tombs and the grottos at Dunhuang, which date to the second quarter of the sixth century. Now, it is also well known that one of the earliest surviving Buddhist icons in China is found in a cave tomb. And this is the Mahal tomb at Lushan in Sichuan, which dates to the Eastern Han. In, in, in this case, we have a Gandharan style seated Buddha placed at the entryway of one of the tombs, which was discovered by Dick Edwards and discussed exclusively, uh, extensively by Wu Hong. There are, in fact, a variety of tombs cut into rock at ground level and in cliffs in Sichuan and Gansu, but perhaps the most famous site is the tomb of Empress Yifu, wife of the Western Wei Emperor Wen, who was buried in 540, or at least it, it, it may have been an actual burial or surrogate burial, in a cliff tomb at the Maijishan Buddhist cave site near Tianshui. Now, Empress Yifu's tomb is found beneath Shrine Cave 43. Now again, the details of this tomb or this virtual tomb are complex and for our purposes today, I merely want to suggest that the architectural style of the rock cut shrine cave would have had mortuary resonances in medieval China. Now to return then to the question of what was going on at Magal. The wall paintings at Magal contain hundreds, if not thousands of depictions of figures engaged in all kinds of religious activities including festivals, ritual practices, and meditation. Many can be used as evidence for what Buddhist practice looked like in the medieval period. There are innumerable depictions of temples and altar settings of sacred mountains and pilgrimage sites and the like. And they're often stylized, but they still offer clues, if you're careful, as to the local understanding of contemporary forms of worship. Now, are there any images of monastic rituals being performed at monumental cave sites such as Magal? We do find depictions of monks meditating in caves, to be sure, such as those found in 285, but curiously, the caves don't resemble the chapel complexes we find at Dunhuang. Subai has done extensive work on the sorts of images we're seeing here, and he argues that they are modeled on small freestanding thatched meditation huts reworked by Central Asian artisans into a more mountainous terrain. I know of no images of monks sitting in front of sutra murals or bian xiang, and the few depictions of monks doing what seem to be visualization practices that are known to, to be of, of the type found at, are, are known to be of the type found at Toyok, in which the monks indeed appear to be engaged in seated meditation. 
but I'm going to come back to Toyuk later on, it is unlikely at Toyuk that the depictions were intended as aids to visualization so much as sources of inspiration. There is, however, one genre of painting at Mogao that very clearly depicts people engaged in Buddhist ritual practices in the caves, and that is the genre of donor images, as we see at the base of the stupa here in Cave 40, uh, 431. The donor images depict processions of laypersons, with monks on one side led by a monk, often uh, females on the other side led by a nun, engaged in typical puja, or gongyang, offerings of flowers, incense, and so on. The kind of offerings made in front of Buddhist images throughout Asia from the medieval period down to the present day. This is Buddhism. Now the offerings are made for the generation of merit, which can then be transferred for the benefit of family members, both living and deceased. And note the inscription, which says that they are in fact in the very act. It's done at the time of making a gongyang, making puja offerings. Now, the scholars have poured over the donor images and accompanying inscriptions at Magal as they allow us to reconstruct the patronage of the caves. And what we find is that it was not uncommon for the donors depicted in the midst of puja to have been deceased at the time the shrine was constructed and consecrated. This can be demonstrated, for example, in caves 56, 98, and 62, among others. Indeed, in 62, some of the adults are depicted with their deceased children. I would also note that the donor images frequently include various markers of status and wealth, including images of, of slaves, as in Northern Way uh, Cave 248, where the donors are female members of the local Swa and Wang clan, clans, depicted along with their slaves. Now to cut to the chase, these images are invaluable for reconstructing ritual function. For one thing, they depict what a ritual in the caves actually looked like. We have a picture of it. And for another, the purported donors, who may or may not have been alive when the cave was excavated, are being memorialized in the act of making perpetual puja, puja offerings to the Buddha. In other words, as in Chinese tombs, the cave shrines provided the ancestors with an auspicious, auspicious sanctuary for their in eternal repose provided that the caves were ritually maintained, which of course required regular monastic-led ceremonies, the cave shrines should continue to generate merit that redounds on the, to the donor's lineal descendants. Note again the connection with images in tombs. This is Prince Jeming's tomb from 710. Except that in the tombs, the images are typically said to be for the pleasure, company, and service of the dead in the afterlife. Now, if I'm correct that the donor images are the closest thing we have to depictions of what actually transpired in the caves, then the ritual context of the artistic program at Macau is not meditating monastics, but rather the veneration of holy icons to generate merit for the deceased. Now, I do not want to suggest that Central Asian caves were never used for meditation practice narrowly construed. In this regard, Toyok provides an interesting contrast to Magal. While Magal was a mere 15 kilometers from a major garrison and market town, Toyok was relatively remote and isolated even by Central Asian standards, being 65 kilometers, kilometers from Turfan. One can indeed imagine a small community of ascetic monks in retreat in the Toyok Valley. In contrast, Mogao would have appeared a bustling construction site, flocking with laborers and artisans and pilgrims throughout the many centuries when excavation and construction was ongoing. What reputable monk would have wanted to practice in the midst of the medieval Buddhist equivalent of Disneyland? <laughs> no, note also that the individual cells in the so-called Vihara caves at Toyok, unlike those at Mogao, are indeed large enough to comfortably accommodate a meditating monk, and they are undecorated except for a few sparsely rendered images of monks engaged in meditation. And what kind of meditation is it? The monks are doing asuba bhavana, or, or bu jingguan, practices. Those are meditations on the stages of the decomposition of a corpse. And more specifically, we find the baiguguan, or meditation on the white bones, which is a transformation of the impurity of the corpse into a pure object at the end of the practice. 
and this very quick, I just love this one. This is um, uh, in, in, the, in, in the Berlin collection of um, a monk meditating on a skull from Kazil. Now, there should be no need to re reiterate here the importance of death as a meditation subject for Buddhist monastics. Here we see a meditation walk in Sri Lanka. It is still considered meritorious in some Theravada countries to contribute one's own skeleton after death or the skeleton of a loved one to a monastery to be used for, for monks who are contemplating death. Uh, in Thailand, those wishing to do the Asuba Bhavana can now gain entry into morgues or find images of corpses in the canonical stages of decomposition on the internet. That's where this comes from. And so I'm suggesting that at Toyok, which presumably was used as a site for meditation by monastics, we find an association between the caves and death. Now, I would remind us that the famous library cave, uh, Cave 17 at Mogao, was originally a memorial chapel for Hong Bien, one of the senior clerics in the Dunhuang region who died in 862. And again, there's no need to reiterate the long association of Buddhist sacred sites with death as embodied in the most ubiquitous form of Buddhist architecture, the stupa or the chaitya, which is a reliquary for the remains of a deceased Buddha or saint. Indeed, the distinctively Chinese riff on the Indian stupa, namely the pagoda, seems to have been influenced by early Chinese mortuary architecture, such as the chue. Now, I don't have time to explore this today, but it should be additional evidence that when the context of a Buddhist site is uncertain, one's best guess, one's default guess, um, the default assumption, as it were, is that it has some memortuary or memorial function. So to return now back to Dunhuang, I would ask rhetorically why Macau is treated so differently than sites at Longmen and Yungang that are widely understood to be merit-generating machines. It is not, I believe, on the basis of its architectural features, its inscriptional record, or its artistic program. It is due, I suspect, to the dimensions of the site coupled with the presence of the cache of manuscripts hidden in Cave 17. The assumption is that a Buddhist site of this scale with a library must have been or at least contained a monastery. And as Buddhist monks meditate, the caves must have been intended to facilitate meditation. But in truth, the origin of the library remains unknown even today. The actual location of the monastery most closely associated with the manuscripts, the San, uh, Sanjie Se, remains uncertain. While many scholars have assumed that it was situated directly in front of the cave, some people have even suggested right in front of Cave 16, there is simply no evidence for this. And based on other sites, it would be, seem much more likely that the monastic communities that rendered ritual service to the Magao shrines were situated in the town of Dunhuang proper. The relationship between the monasteries and the grottoes would then be similar to the relationship between monasteries and grottoes at Lungmen and Yungang, where we know individual caves were under the jurisdiction of specific monasteries in the towns a short haul away. So what might this excursion into archaeological context tell us about the nature of the art found at Magal? I would suggest that, uh, that it is a caution against imagining without adequate evidence that major Buddhist sites were intended by definition, as it were, to facilitate monastic practices. In the case of the Magao, while there are clearly significant differences between one cave and the next, between one period and the next, it is impossible to generalize. But in the absence of evidence otherwise, it is more plausible that the caves were intended for mortuary and memorial purposes than for meditation. The production of merit for the benefit of deceased king, kin through the creation of Buddhist images is probably the single most popular and widespread practice in Buddhist Asia. And it should not surprise us then that this, if this was the intention of the donors at Mogao as well. So let me just end with a brief comment on the art of the caves. As some question, um, as some have questioned whether it's appropriate to use the modern category art at all for pre-modern icons intended for ritual veneration. So if I'm correct in my analysis of the caves, then the ritual function of the innumerable icons and painted narratives scenes at Mogal are largely realized at the moment they were consecrated. That is why 
the fact that the caves would have been so dark and the image is virtually impossible to see, you have to remember when you see the, the, the caves today, they had a superstructure on the front. You had to enter through uh, often what was one, sometimes even two shrine rooms before you get to the shrine at the back. So those caves were dark. And that is why the fact that they were dark and the image is virtually impossible, or at least very difficult to see, is irrelevant when it comes to their religious purpose. And indeed, because the images did not serve a function in some ongoing ritual activity, such as meditation, I have suggested that they are closer to the modern, or if you were, the Renaissance sense of the term art than some have suggested. The artists at Magal were not saddled with the task of creating work to accommodate some specific ceremonial or ritual function, and this gave them the freedom to create works that would arouse their patrons' aesthetic, affective, and intellectual interest. And since competition for patronage was presumably intense, there was even more riding on the aesthetic success of such an endeavor. And I'm not denying that the images simultaneously played a role in a religious economy. My argument is simply that in and of itself, this does not detract from the artistic autonomy of the works. And, this is, and, it, is this and it is precisely this autonomy, a non-instrumental modality that gives pride of place to aesthetic concerns that we most commonly associate with the modern term art. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Michelle McCoy. Uh, Michelle is a PhD uh, candidate at the University of California, Berkeley, and a research fellow uh, at the National Galleries of Art. Uh, she will be speaking about the procession of the radiant, effulgent uh, Buddha. Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this symposium. Um, yeah, that's good, that's good, thank you. Okay, so uh, sometime between the 11th and 14th centuries, the corridor of a massive mid-10th century grotto dedicated to the Bodhisattva Manjushri was repainted. To each wall in this roughly nine meter long space was added a procession of the effulgent Buddha, or Chusheng Guangfu, Lord of the visible heavens and his retinue of planets and stars. Though the east portions of both murals have been completely lost, the south wall preserves this Buddha, also known as Tejaprabha, seated on a lotus throne atop a two-wheeled cart. He guides his assembly of planets, lunar lodges, or stations of the moon, and zodiac signs through the heavens on a raft of billowing clouds, neutralizing their potential to bring calamity to the human realm as effortlessly as he balances the blazing golden wheel on his right index finger, which you see there. Though much less of the procession is preserved on the north wall, its own partial cast of planets, lunar lodges, and zodiac signs is still discernible. One issue immediately stands out here. While these paintings reproduce the same content in two different configurations on facing, uh, these paintings reproduce the same content on two different configurations on facing walls. While the modular underpinnings of later Dunhuang paintings, um, understanding of which we owe much to Sarah Fraser's work, led to the frequent repetition of motif and composition from grotto to grotto, the repetition of subject matter within a single grotto is rare. Two distinct compositions featuring the same subject matter on facing walls is, to my knowledge, virtually unattested outside this grotto. That this phenomenon appears here, in one of the largest and most historically prominent of all the Dunhuang grottos, can hardly be accidental or arbitrary. My presentation today focuses on the seemingly straightforward questions that arise from this observation. Why are there two effulgent Buddha processions, and where are they going? Um, designated Cave 61 in the current numbering system, 
This grotto was known historically as Menju Shui Hall or Wen Shu Tang due to the Bodhisattva's unusual position as the central icon. So that's the main chamber you can see there. Um, though now missing, scholars have inferred his presence by the remnant of the sculpted lion that would have served as his vehicle, you can see here. Spanning the entire roughly 13.75 meters wide wall behind Menju Shui is a colossal panoramic depiction of Wu Taishan, his mountain abode in present day Shanxi, and a, pl Shanxi and a place revered from medieval through late imperial China as a site of frequent supernatural manifestations. The painting's size, subject matter, and striking topographic specificity have made this one of the best studied grottos at Donghong, um, including by several, several scholars here today. No previous study has examined in depth how the corridor murals relate to the main chamber, and the reuse and renovation of Donghong grottos is a generally understudied topic uh, for art historical study. Though these paintings' fine line work and subtle handling of color speak of skilled artistry, their condition today presents serious challenges to research. Not only were lar large portions of the paintings removed or attempts were made to do so and later aborted, they also seem to have been reworked in multiple stages. On the basis of on-site um, study and high-resolution digital photography, which unfortunately I've not been able to include at the um, same quality in this presentation today, my analysis works successively outward. First, I will re-examine key deities in each painting, pr proposing new identifications for them, then move to a partial reconstruction of each wall, and finally address the relationship to each, each other and to the total cave. This analysis shows that these paintings were produced in direct response to the Menju Shui icon and the Wu Taishan painting, serving as a kind of celestial pendant to the main chamber's terrestrial theater of miraculous manifestation. They therefore expand the grotto's overall purview to include the important period concern of portent astrology, offer insight into a lesser studied moment in the history of the Wu Taishan cult, and significant for the study of art history, transform the overall logic of the cave by enfolding the main chamber into a new dynamic of what we could call intercompositional relations. Questions of date, patronage, and subject matter have been the main concerns of previous scholarship on the quarter paintings. They are currently dated to either the Xixia or Yuan period. The Xixia state was founded by a Changik people known in Western literature as Tengit, who spoke a Tibeto-Burman language and controlled Donghuang between roughly the mid 11th century and 1227. They are known for inventing a script in use beginning in the 11th century and into the Ming Dynasty that was developed on principles formally similar to that, those of written Chinese, though the two languages are very different. During the subsequent Mongol Yuan Dynasty, Tangut language and culture still had a vibrant, present, vibrant presence in Inner Asia and parts of China. Whatever their precise date of production, the wall painting subject matter and style are greatly indebted to Tangut culture in the Xixia state, where Buddhist astral deity worship was an important component of elite religion. These murals were sponsored and worshipped by a multi-ethnic group, as evidenced by bilingual Chinese and Tangut inscriptions on the north and south walls. According to Shu Jinbo's research, the inscriptions identify donors with either Tangut or Chinese surnames. Like the picture of Wu Taishan, the effulgent Buddha paintings in Cave 61 are not standard sutra transformations, or jingbian, in the sense that the verbal knowledge they each represent greatly exceeds any single sutra or other textual tradition. The effulgent Buddha paintings specifically encode a network of astrological and iconographic knowledge that migrated across much of the medieval Eurasian and Indian landmasses and between a number of religions. I address this history in depth in my dissertation and have time to touch on it only briefly here. In terms of pictorial evidence, between the production of the earliest known depictions of the effulgent Buddha, such as the library cave banner dated to 897, which you see here, and the cave 61 corridor paintings, um, his astral retinue grew to include the ecliptic or Hellenistic zodiac signs and the lunar lodges. The number of planets, moreover, grew from five to 11. So here you see five planets. The visible planets of Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mercury, along with the sun and moon, form the group of five and seven stars or luminaries, Yao. Next came the Indian pseudo planets, Rahu and Ketu, who were understood in a variety of ways, both mythical and astronomical, as the entities responsible for eclipses or comets. And you see them represented as demonic masks in the middle. Um, they therefore were regarded as dangerous phenomena capable of bringing harm to the state and individuals. 
They constituted the Navagraha, or Nine Caesars, a name derived from their role as commanders of individual fate in Indian horoscopic astrology. Eleven re resulted from the introduction of Zixi and Yuebo, whom we see here and here. Uh, two more pseudo-planets, or personifications not of visible astral bodies, but of transient phenomena or events. Their origins are still quite obscure, but they are sometimes cast as the offspring or efflorescences of Jupiter and Saturn, respectively, in the Chinese, in Chinese and Tanga texts. As Liaoyang has discussed, these last two plant, pseudo planets have particularly complicated histories in Taoist practice and visual culture, an important topic that's beyond the scope of this presentation today. Comparison of uh, the library cave paintings of the effulgent Buddha's procession um, and the quarter murals shed light, sheds light on the identities of the planets on the south wall. So Venus, an elegant woman holding a pipa, and Mars, a multi-armed, wrathful redhead carrying a trident, are paired on one side of the cart. Mercury, a woman with a golden headdress, shares a side with Jupiter. The corner of the paper that would have um, served along with a brush as her attribute is just barely visible um, in the surviving portion above the loss, which um, is unfortunately lost in the slide. Saturn, who is always depicted as a Brahmin-type figure guiding the ox or making offerings, would likely have been positioned out in front. The closest analog in terms of, for the quarter paintings in 61, is a subset of the Tangut astral deity materials that were taken from the ruins of Karakoto in present-day Inner Mongolia and are now stored in St. Petersburg, most of them. According to period conventions, the Cave 61 assembly should feature 11 planets, a notion supported by the appearance of three distinct male planets dressed as officials, the Sun, Jupiter, and his protege, Zixi. The Sun is shown on um, both walls with a sun disk, and Jupiter can be identified as one of the officials holding a peach that symbolizes divine nectar. The younger-looking official to whom he gestures, whose identity has up, now, up to now been elusive, is likely Zixi. His mesh-covered cap is similar to the same figure in Karakoto paintings, and this would locate him on the south wall to the left of Venus. Um, the identities of the extant pseudoplanets are more challenging. Remnants of a green, multi-armed, wrathful figure, which may actually be two figures, appear in front of the cart. The well-preserved figure behind the cart, who was previously identified as Ketu, with loose hair and holding a severed head, um, corresponds to a Tangut convention for depicting Yuebo. Though in this Karakoto painting, Yuebo takes feminine form. Broadening out to the question of the overall compositions, a procession might seem a natural choice here, given the transitional role of the corridor in Buddhist grotto architecture. However, processional scenes in general are uncommon at Dunhuang, where the corridors of other large 9th and 10th century grottos often feature over life-sized donor portraits. Meng Suhui's 1997 study of depictions of the effulgent Buddha produced from the Tang through Yuan periods, which was the first to examine the study in depth across multiple sites, established a loosely chronological three-part division of compositional types in which the procession appear appears first. Though these stages, and here's the third, though these stages overlap significantly in the material produced across present-day China, not to mention the very distinct traditions in Korea and Japan. Um, in the Xixia and Yuan periods, the static assemblies are the dominant formats. The use of the procession in Cave 61 is particularly striking in the Donghuang region, where all surviving effulgent Buddha paintings predating the Xixia take that form, and the only other example post-dating the 10th century is the same assembly type seen at other Xixia sites. Given the sophisticated concept of style evidenced by Xixia and Yuan period artists at Dunhuang, particularly at the Yuling grottos, I suspect the choice of the procession here may have been an insider's adaptation of local visual tradition or even a self-conscious archaicism. Compositional format, moreover, is strongly linked to the painting's position or an orientation within the grotto. As in Cave 61, the Yulin example is positioned in the antechamber, and here the Buddha's procession points to in toward the main chamber, so we're talking about this one here. Um, there are later statues in front of this wall painting, making photography very difficult. That's why we only see part of the composition. Um, however, the Yulin Cave 35 painting is relatively small, 
self-contained, and shares the wall with other discrete pictorial content. Thus, it does not exert the same all-encompassing directional force that the corridor in Cave 61 would have. To whatever extent their compositions were meant to re reference an earlier era or local tradition, the figures populating the Cave 61 corridor remain of its own. In addition to their increased number and uniformly anthropomorphic appearances, the planet's heightened affect is consistent with religious figure painting of that time, in which the social nature of gods was depicted with ever greater interest and specificity. In each composition, they turn toward and gesture at one another, and more significantly, now to the spaces and figures beyond, their poses, attributes, and even positions changing between the north and south walls. The dynamic sociality of the procession masks the underlying logic in the planet's positions, which in the Tengen and Yuan periods joins numer numerological or astrological concerns on the one hand, with elements of design such as symmetry and geometricity on the other. As in the Karakoto materials, the Cave 61 planetary deities seem to have paired according to gender, astral valence, or other correlative factors. Their halo colors, as you see in this painting, often make such um, affinities and contrasts explicit. Thus, the motivation for repositioning the south wall planets in contrast with earlier Dongpang materials comes to light. Their pairing according to gender, gender or astral valence adds another layer of meaning of an analytic or computational nature. This distinctive combination of affect and logic, to my mind, lends these paintings an other world, their otherworldly quality. Raising the question of where the effulgent Buddha appears on the north wall sets in motion the final step in reconstructing the relationship between the two compositions, and theirs to the cave as a whole. He has previously been proposed to be the figure to the right of the group of monks, no doubt and due to the parasol loft, lofted over him, his enlarged size, and his seemingly isolated position mirroring the effulgent Buddha's own placement on the south wall. Closer inspection shows that this figure, which does not evidence the same line modulation as the other content and seems to have been pr produced on a modified ground, was probably added later. Moreover, his offering, a brazier whose smoke plumes still rise above the now lost vessel itself, and the tablet-like cartouche to his right indicate that he was me meant to represent a high status monastic donor or worshiper rather than a deity. Tellingly, this figure faces in the same direction as the monks, contradicting a general principle of Buddhist art whereby donors face, are in a facing relationship with the deity they venerate. It follows then that the original position of the effulgent Buddha on the north wall was in the section to the right of the surviving planetary deities who assemble before him. He faces inward toward his worshipers and the central Manjushri icon beyond. He is in the process of traveling, it now seems clear, to hold an audience with Manjushri at his mountain home. Viewed in this light, the paintings do not really duplicate subject matter at all, but rather represent the same assembly at different moments. Um, the better pre preserved uh, south wall procession is therefore the after to the north walls before depicting the effulgent Buddha and his assembled deities in a state of departure, having completed their audience. The lone human worshiper here, a nun standing with a flower pressed between her palms, faces inward toward Manjushri. This supplies the, a crucial backwards glance that knits together the south wall with the main chamber and permanently recalls the effulgent Buddha's audience there, even in his ongoing exit. This before and after arrival and departure reading bears out in the iconographic differences between north and south walls. For example, whereas on the north wall, Venus is actively playing the lute, her golden headdress exposed, on the south wall, the goddess's hands, headdress, and instrument are draped with cloth, her performance now finished. The sun, moreover, carries on the north wall a tablet used in imperial ritual that on the south wall has been put away. Jupiter, likewise, no longer carries the peach and tablet, as on the north wall, and instead pushes the axle of the cart vigorously forward, his wide sleeve flying behind him, a counterbalance to the rope pulled taut against the now lost ox, which you can just make out here. Here's the rope. Intently ushering the procession out of the grotto, he directly embodies the act of departure. The clouds are essential to this intercompositional work. Each of the three types of, in the two tableau play a dis, plays a distinct temporal and spatial role whereas the narrow horizontal bands behind the lunar lodges establish the basic deep space celestial setting, 
The thinner, diagonally striated wisps indicate overall movement from the distance. The billows of cushiony banks, finally, both record and anticipate the specific movements of the groups they support, upward and inward on the north wall, downward and outward on the south. In addition to knitting together the two corridor walls, the clouds also connect the effulgent Buddha procession back to the Wu Taishan painting, in which similar billowy clouds serve as vehicles to the myriad manifestations filling that landscape. In its broadest function, the corridor thus introduces a new spatial temporal dynamic in which the main chamber now ineluctably participates. The processions, gesturing either ahead or behind, cast the Manjushri icon, we can imagine, in a kind of permanently receptive stasis. Whereas our speculation might normally center on how historical devotees experience the grotto, with ancestor and donor portraits often serving as guides or proxies, the corridor in Cave 61 now urges us, the corridor paintings in Cave 61 now urge us to imagine the path of another deity. Enacted with the compound media grotto, the astral deity's pilgrimage to this transplanted Wu Taishan and manifested Manjushri becomes not only a perpetual assembly, but also evacuates the need for a human to enact or perceive it. This treads a similar line to the virtual rituals in other medieval Buddhist contexts theorized by Eugene Wong and others. Now that I have proposed an answer to the question of where the procession is going, what remains is that of why the effulgent Buddha should hold an audience with Manjushri at Wu Taishan. From a historical and social perspective, an answer comes relatively easily. Both were closely linked to imperial, imperial authority. Manjushri is a tutelary deity of, Tang at beginning, of emperors beginning the Tang, and the effulgent Buddha is a safeguard against inauspicious signs that might threaten the emperor's legitimacy. As several scholars have noted, a similar connection appears in a hagiography of the eminent Tang dynasty monk, Amogavadra Bukong, when visiting Wu Taishan at imperial request in 770, he used Buddhist ritual to neutralize the bad influence of a comet that had appeared there. The importance of this connection, moreover, is underscored by Manjushri's role as interlocutor in numerous astral sutras, which Zhao Shengliang, among others, has, has noted in his study of these paintings. Such a connection persisted in Tangut language translation of the effulgent Buddha Dharani or in incantation. As the very existence of paintings of Wu Taishan at Dunhuang demonstrates, the interest in patronizing this site extended far beyond rulers of the Chinese Central Plains to those for whom the journey to Shanxi may have been rendered impossible by political barriers. Xixia rulers, like the Liao, went so far as to transpose the entire site, calling theirs northern Wu Taishan, set in the Hulan Mountains near their capital. For these Tangut rulers, Wu Taishan patronage was, as Karl de Bresny put it, a natural step in the formation of Xixia Buddhist state ideology. The effulgent Buddha's procession uh, appearance in the corridor of Cave 61 adds another layer of political significance, I think. Historians of science tell us that the phenomenon of the five planet convergence in traditional Chinese astrology and astronomy was of paramount importance. So that's when uh, the five planets visible to the naked eye uh, gather very closely in, in the heavens. Regarded as a sign of the transfer of heaven's mandate, such events, as David Pankinier writes, factor significantly into accounts of dynast dynastic founding, including the Song, who recorded one such convergence in April of 967 during the reign of that dynasty's first emperor. If the planetary assemblies in Cave 61 indeed appropriate this trope of epochal dynastic political transformation, into the Buddhist context of Dunhuang, they then fur furnish compelling motivation for repainting a cave so closely linked with interregional authority. In this interpretation, the effulgent Buddha, in his cart with dragon pennants flying, would become the literal standard bearer for a new political era. The pre-modern redecoration and reuse of, the Dun of Dunhuang grottoes is a rich history that has yet to be fully explored due in part to the challenges of basic historical research and the tendency to view later renovations as mere concealments of superior painting. I have argued that the additions to the corridor of Cave 61 do not merely update the cave contents by introducing a newly important deity or capitalize on cultural and religious prestige by means of simple interpolation. Instead, they are a complex pictorial tribute to the interior program that ultimately reconfigures the overall logic of what is now and was surely also then one of Dunhuang's most distinctive grottos. Thank you.
Okay, I'd like to invite the speakers up to the stage, please. Uh, we have a few moments for questions and answers, and I believe there should be uh, microphones available for the audience uh, to use. So if you want to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone uh, to arrive. And then right here. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, my question is, or co and comments are for um, Bob Sharf, but they touch a little bit on um, uh, Mich uh, Michelle McCoy's uh, presentation too. So I should uh, first say um, that I uh, I think it's great that you take you take on important issues, and so I generally agree with you. So I'm not my. It, Intervention or my questions uh, or challenges are not meant to um, challenge your uh, overall sort of uh, premises. So, um, but w one thing, um, it, there's two caves that uh, that are sort of um, diametrically opposed or really different in dating. Cave uh, 431, I think you showed in Cave 61. I would say in general, right, those, I mean, obviously the premise is that those are about uh, merit making, but they're from di different periods. And so I would encourage you if you want to, I mean, I don't know if you're going to revisit, keep on revisiting this, but you could nuance that part of your discussion if you want to become more art historian-like, but maybe you don't. Um, <laughs> but the two things that um, I, I, I guess I, I want to... Um, ask you to maybe um, uh, dilate more and talk about, um, open up a little bit more, is th these two comments that you said. Why would any, why would the monks want to meditate or practice in a Disneyland, which I, th and then the other comment was, um, uh, hmm, let's see, I, yeah, um, okay, I guess we'll start with that. And then uh, all, uh, all, that all the temples were in, in town, and so, um, oh, I know, the other one was um, that why, why is everyone treating Drinhuang as, as such a special case, and why, why don't we look at Drinhuang vis-a-vis -vis other sites? And so the question back to you then is, what about the northern section? There's okay. 190 so, caves there, yeah. so, and they have residential components. And so it seems to me, if you're going to, you know, challenge the whole field or whatever, make this argument, you've got to take that into account. And periodization. I, 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 thank Professor you. Pung yeah. has done a lot of work there, Masha Chang, and so forth. And um, this Disneyland comment, I think, is a little okay, overstated. So just give me a chance, because what I'm doing today is summarizing. Look, there's a paper. It's actually difficult to get. It was it was published in a. Uh, edited volume from the Courtauld Institute. They did a beautiful job publishing, but it's not easy to get. But if you uh, Google Robert Scharf website, you'll get to my website. You can download the paper. It's called Art in the Dark. It addresses the northern caves. It addresses, to, in a very simple way, here, here's the quick answer because we have so little time today. Um, I am not suggesting that certain caves weren't there to be entered and used regularly. 90, that, that one of the reasons you have these so-called anchor caves at the sites, you know, the, the colossal image caves and so on, is precisely to give a place for pilgrims and tourists to go into and worship. I am suggesting that many of the, you know, the shrine caves that were uh, donated and patronized by individuals were probably not used on a regular basis. We do not have evidence. You, you would expect to find traces of uh, incense and, and soot and stuff on the ceiling. If you go into old temples, it's everywhere. You can see this is an active temple. When you go into many of the shrines at Dunhuang, you just don't find that. So I'm just suggesting that they weren't meant to be entered to be effective any more than a tomb was meant to be entered to be effective. As far as the northern caves, there were thousands of laborers at this site in its in this heyday. And so there's every reason to believe that m uh, we don't know who was living in the, the northern caves, but there'd be no particular reason to believe that the northern caves constituted a monastery any more than 
that that was where the laborers lived who were working continuously on this site for a, for a good hunk of time. And finally, again, I'm not suggesting that it was not originally a site like Toyuk, like Kizil, which may have started out as a small cluster of monks meditating there, but I am suggesting that when the money moves in, the monks move out. Right? <laughs> And, and I would say that, that no one's arguing with you. I mean, no one's, I, I think it's a little bit outdated to say that everyone's saying that, every, that people meditated in all the caves and all the caves were used the same way. That's and great. I would say that you have to put it in positive terms and it was just really great when you just said that there's anchor caves and these caves were used differently. I mean, I, I think you're almost arguing against a kind of straw man, but anyway. Yeah, that's great. Next. Uh, good. Hello, everybody. Um, I have actually been blessed to have visited uh, Magau, so I have a couple of questions directed to anyone on the panel. One is it, why was it that Magau was not plundered, like, for example, the Bezalik cave site near Turfan with its mostly lost Meninchian art? And is there any Meninchian art, that I'm, I'm not aware of it, in Magau? So I'd like to have both questions answered because it's been very puzzling to me and f certainly fortunate, again, that Magau, to my knowledge, was not plundered. Thank you. Uh, I think I can take this question on. Uh, I actually been working a lot on uh, the uh, later development of this site. Can, can you hear me? Uh, I think it's actually quite fortunate Explorers didn't make it to Donghuang, even though they planned to. Uh, as you know about what they did uh, in Kucha at a lot of the Cape Tambo sites, they systematically removed many of the, the murals, uh, not once, but actually multiple times. And they actually planned to go to uh, Donghuang because they heard about Oral Stein, and actually they, uh, they were in contact with him. Uh, it, it's just uh, fates that they didn't make it there. Yeah, I, th I think you may also be referring to Biziklek for the, yes, for the, for the Manking. Yes, they, they were in both Turfan and Kucha. Another point I want to make is that uh, in, in this time period, people were obsessed with manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, not so much with wall paintings. And in fact, when the Germans went to both uh, Turfan and Kizil, they were looking for manuscripts. They didn't find enough, so they started to work on the wall paintings. Yeah. And the, 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 the other obvious point is that there, was, there, there were people at Dunhuang when the Europeans started to arrive, and they had to go through those people. It's not clear that, uh, I think some of these sites, Toyok in particular, but Bizaklek also, they were quite isolated. It's not clear that there was anybody there even doing a, a, a moderate job of protecting them. So they were just open game for people who went through. And what is the speculation why there's no art of the followers of Mani in uh, Magadha? In well, it, it, I, I would just point out one more thing, which again, I think the specialists all know better than I do, is that a lot of the Dun Quai, when you look at Dun Huang, you're looking at caves which were often revamped over and over and over again. And because it was such an active site for so long, we don't know what the underlayers are. There's still, there's still possibility of stripping off, in some cases, they actually plastered over walls. So the fact that there may not be much evidence of Manichaean art there now does not necessarily tell you that it didn't exist at some point. And I would just add that um, there is Manichaean materials from the library cave. So in the exhibition, the old Turkic divination manuscript, the Irkbitig, I think is thought by specialists to have been produced in a Manichaean context. Thank you. You're welcome. No. A comment. Um, thank you very much for the fascinating paper. I really enjoy your kind of interpretation of the corridor of Cave 61. And um, I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about Xixia Tanga kind of repainting practices around that time. And I know there's a lot of debate about Xixia cave datings. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, also, um, just a little bit of comment. Um, I was in Dunhuang last year, and um, we met a young archaeologist that works for the Institute of Social Sciences in China. 
Um, and he's been um, doing um, a lot of archaeological new digs in Toyok. So um, he says there are a lot of actually a lot of new findings at Toyok, and, and the site's actually much larger than what we've known before. Um, of course, the um, the results and reports we still have to wait. So probably there'll be more interesting findings there, and it's uh, probably much larger than um, um, the previous digs that we've known in the early 20th century. Thank you. So on the question of Shisha painting at the Moga site in particular, or at Donghong in general, I think it's, it's tricky because the really distinctive, clearly Shisha painting is at Yulin. And the Cave 61, I mean, Professor Lee's talk included a an, an very interesting, distinctive Shisha period painting, but a lot of what's considered Xixia painting now is this sort of relatively generic, kind of large chamfer motif um, that's added to you know, the front parts of ma inner cha main chambers, the western wall or above it. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for discussion on what exactly is Xixia period painting. And it really, I think, relates to what their relationship to Dunhuang historically was in the first place. Um, so in the case of Cave 61, this Cave 61 corridor, that is a, a highly distinctive painting, of course. Um, and stylistically, it does correspond quite closely to the Karakota materials, I think. But those materials are also, um, you know, some of them are datable with, with relative precision, and then some of them are not. We don't know, you know, some of those Karakota paintings could have been made in the Yuan as, as well. Um, Specialists might disagree with that statement, but I think it's open for discussion. Thank you. Did you want to um, I have a question for Professor uh, Robert Chef. Um, so I really like your like um, lecture today, and I have a question. So uh, you're talking about that the function, the ritual function of the Mogo uh, cave may not be mainly is monastic meditations, but I have a question. Is there any possibilities that um, the caves have a very um, important function for the layman to meditate? Because you're mentioning that many of the caves are patronized by, by the layman believers, and maybe they're not for the monastic, uh, for the monks to meditate, but is that possible for the I, I, anything is possible, but uh, I don't think we have any evidence. I, I mean, I, I'm not even sure what would constitute, but I'm not saying it's not possible. I will say that the, to connect it with the question that came before, the reason I like focusing on Toyok is because at Toyok, and there's other sites um, in, in the, in the Turfan and, and Taklamakan areas as well, you have real, what looked like meditation cells. And you look at them, and, and, and they're not professionally painted, but often there's these kind of very rough sketches like I gave you today that look like just somebody was having fun in there. Uh, you can imagine monks practicing in such cells. Uh, there's every reason to believe, but it's again purely speculative, that such caves existed at Dunhuang, but they were re-excavated. The easiest way to make a cave is to re-excavate -ex uh, an, an extant cave. And so it's interesting that all those caves, if you assume that many of these sites may have started like that, they all end up gone. And what you end up are token Disneyland Diana caves like you get in 285 with cells that are quite clearly token cells. But again, would lay people meditate in there? There's, it, it, for, as, a, as a religious historian, the assumption is generally that uh, lay people meditating was very, very rare throughout the history of Buddhism. And we do know certain moments. I mean, early Chan was one, um, which were in some ways, um, they were trying to get lay people to meditate. It happens again at the beginning of the Ming Dynasty. There are various different moments in Buddhist history when we discover an interest in promoting meditation among the laity. Um, but the fact that those moments <laughs> that we know about them is, indicates that it's generally rare. Oh, there. Okay. 
Um, this is a question by a non-specialist, obviously. Uh, for Sonia, I was interested in your um, uh, talk about uh, self-mutilation and um, sacrificing parts of one's own body uh, in, and, uh, in, in relation to ascetism. Uh, and uh, this change from uh, emphasizing that towards de-emphasizing that. Uh, I was wondering, is there any link to ideas of Sinization of these topics. I, I vaguely remember a discussion in which I think Han Yu in the Tang Dynasty was engaged who argued for the preservation of one's body on the Confucian concept of uh, you know, um, having received it from one's parents and so on. Uh, uh, so uh, I was wondering whether this might have been some you know, aspect behind that. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, Winston Kayang has actually has done extensive work on this particular connection between uh, self-sacrifices that you see in Buddhism uh, in relation to uh, the whole process of sinicization and how some of these uh, values and, and uh, are, are we worked to fit within the so-called Confucian context. Uh, for me, uh, I think I'm more interested in how these images were used as some form of argumentation within the Buddhist context that uh, uh, there seems to be some self-consciousness and doubts about uh, what's really Buddhist about uh, their approach to enlightenment versus uh, the non-Buddhist way. So this is what I'm trying to emphasize here. But I think for this connection, uh, I think Winston's work would be quite relevant for, for your interest. Well, just to pick up on the uh, comment and raised earlier about uh, whether the lay people uh, practice visualization or meditation in the cave, uh, I, uh, and, and to reconcile Bob and that question, I guess, uh, is, uh, I think uh, uh, Bob is probably a bit too muscular and the other is probably too anemic in the sense that uh, <laughs> um, I think there is a... Uh, one could say that, you know, uh, maybe not meditation in the cave, but there might be repentance ritual done in the cave uh, by the lay community, and that repentance automatically would involve aspects of meditation. So in that sense, yes, there, yes, there is probably, um, uh, there was um, uh, lay communities uh, ritual held in terms of repentance, because the repentance is important in getting good result for their well-beings, and, and so in that sense. But, uh, but to uh, reinforce a point that uh, Bob made, uh, that it, even though the rituals will be held there, wouldn't, uh, in other words, the, the meaning and function of the murals wouldn't depend on these rituals to be meaningful. In other words, you can do all kinds of things in the cave, and uh, they, the, the, the meaning of the painting wouldn't necessarily depend on what you do there. So in that sense, I agree with Bob. But I want to um, go back to the a point that uh, Sonia uh, raised, which is very interesting. I love your paper and uh, presentation. But there's one tiny point I thought was um, worth a little bit of clarification. You said that, you know, um, as art historians, uh, I believe that, you know, all the paintings need a viewer <laughs> to be meaningful. Um, in general, I, I believe that's true, but in the case of uh, Deng Huang and many other cave sites, it may not be true, because um, I have a striking case, which I discussed in my book, first chapter, that uh, in Yungang Cave 38, which is a tiny, tiny cell, uh, but of all the Yungang Cave, this is second richest in the uh, relief sculpture uh, content. In other words, you have tiny cell where I went in. It basically, I couldn't stand erect. Uh, it's really tiny, but it really has the richest uh, content in terms of iconography. So the chances are that that cell, all that rich variety of sculptural details are for viewing is probably not true. In other words, I mean, first of all, you have to really climb up there 
um, and I have to go on the ladder to go up there. And once you're in, uh, if you're sitting there, you couldn't see the K uh, or the relief on the wall. So, but it has a very intricate program. And the program is so well structured. Uh, it has all the steps on how you kind of get to uh, Nirvana. So my theory, therefore, is that that program itself is enacting a process. And that enactment doesn't re really require. It's actually for, uh, it in a way, supports uh, Bob's uh, theory that uh, because it, it, it is, um, it's, a, it's a memorial shrine. In a th it, it's a Wu family. The son died. So they're doing this for the deceased son, uh, in which case that it doesn't really matter whether there was someone there looking at it. But the patron family would probably take comfort in the thought that you have this whole program enacting that uh, uh, way past to nirvana, which again goes back to Bob's uh, final. I guess our theory are the similar, but we have different punchlines because you end up. <laughs> You end up with aesthetic autonomy. I end up with these program acting, doing things. Um, but this, this, this uh, Yungang cap really uh, shows that, because uh, your theory largely holds, but then there's one thing you have to address, which is that why is it that in the dark they have to have a program there, right? I mean, if it's just for uh, general merit, it's just for making to, win the competition with other Paging families, you could just paint a beautiful Buddha and that would do the job. But the thing is, in a number of cases we know that they took care to design a very intricate iconic program. And I think for good reason. And the reason is that they want that program to work. And in the case of Dung, um, uh, Yungang, that clearly is a way to Nirvana for their diseased son. So I guess I support all of you, yeah. but it needs some kind of uh, made it, just, made it, uh, just, modification. Yeah. Yeah. One, one more quick point, which oh, I, uh, oh. my suspicion is that Eugene will agree on this, but it just may not be clear to, to people who haven't been there. Virtually all of these caves, there's an inner sanctum and there was an outer sanctum. Right? So when we talk about the caves, we're usually talking what would have been an inner chamber. There was always an outer chamber. And again, my sense is that members of the clan could come on a regular basis, and that was where you did a quickie puja. You didn't have to actually enter the caves. But those outer shrines, they're gone for the most part. They're gone. They were uh, often part of the lattice work of uh, wooden scaffolding that, that fronted um, the cave. I'm afraid that we ran out of time, and I, I wasn't paying attention. I was so uh, enthralled with the discussion. Uh, but I, I think uh, we do need to take a, a coffee break at this time. <laughs>